I think that Adbusters said it best. Everyone hates hipsters, <laughs> especially hipsters. <laughs> so I'm going to talk about why that is today. And perhaps more interestingly, what I think it says about America's collective identity today and where we are as a society. I'm going to tell a personal story about hip hop. And I promise it'll be relevant to my conclusion. I grew up in the suburbs in Seattle, upper middle class white family, went to the same prep school that Bill Gates and Paul Allen went to. So naturally, I was obsessed with black urban rap culture, <laughs> as were all of my friends. Hip hop became an important part of my identity influencing the music that I listened to, starting with NWA and Too Short, and the clothes that I was wearing, much baggier jeans than I wear today, and uh, Chicago Bulls starter jacket. Even to my academic pursuits, a freshman year Stanford writing seminar, my final paper was called The Life and Death of Gangster Rap, an in-depth analysis into the careers of the notorious B.I.G. and Tupac. Uh, I got an A minus, I think. <laughs> I even made music. I became obsessed with freestyle rapping. I recorded some albums of my own material and started a live hip hop band. And yet, despite all of this identification with these different elements of hip hop and rap culture, I was afraid to call myself a rapper. I never called myself a rapper. I was so insecure and caught up with my background as a white, affluent kid from the suburbs that I didn't see how I could identify with this, this subculture that represented a different socioeconomic, different ethnic background. So it wasn't until rap found its way into my career that this started to make more sense, and I, I began to think of myself in the light of hip hop. I worked in tech for a while as a program manager, and despite whatever contributions I made to technology, what I was best known was for the rap songs that I wrote about the people and the products that we were releasing for launch parties. So it was like the Zillow, Search and Maps, Z4 rap, and uh, the Windows Vista photo story rap, and all this stuff. And, it wasn't actually until that culminated in the first music video that I made that I began to accept this. And that was something called Mac or PC, which was a song parody of the virtues of the PC and the Mac. You might recognize me here. So this was released on something called YouTube. And it wasn't until that went viral that I realized that people actually saw value in what I was talking about and what I was rapping about, and that it wasn't about what I had heard on the radio and what I had formerly been interested in and what I thought was cool in this culture that I, I wasn't a part of, but it was about what I was actually passionate about. It was about technology. It was about dorky stuff. And I got a lot of affirmation there, and I said, finally okay, I am a rapper. I am comfortable with that. And once I owned that as part of my identity, cool things started to happen. I started to get positive reinforcement from the world and you know, sort of put out that energy and it, it comes back to you. Opportunities showed up. In my current company, we do a bunch of video production and sort of new media that was born out of, out of this energy. I was no longer afraid to express myself and believe in something. Now, the thing is, we're still waiting for people to call themselves a hipster. We're still waiting for people to claim that name. It hasn't happened yet. And so I, I want to talk about, first of all, what, what is a hipster? Let's get that out of the way. And then talk a bit about why that is, and more importantly, what I think it says about American collective identity. So what I'm not talking about when I say the hipster is the original hipster. It's kind of hard to find a great definition when no one will identify with this subculture because there aren't a lot of experts who you can ask. <laughs> but Norman Mailer might be one. Um, he wrote an original book in 1950s called The White Negro, which was one of the first 
utterances of the word hipster. And it was a more or less about a portrait of a psychopath and sort of white people emulating black culture loosely. Another example was Anatole Broyard's The Portrait of a Hipster, which went a little bit deeper and, and talked about flight New York and the uh, renaissance of jazz and bebop, the emergence of jive as a way of talking and an attitude, tea, which of course meant marijuana. This was all sort of the 1950s hipster, and James Dean was sort of a, a popular icon around that. Now, that's not what I'm talking about. What I am talking about is the modern hipster, which was born out of some influences around 1999. What was going on then was WTO riots in Seattle. So I was in Seattle. I was a senior in high school at that time, and it was that sort of inarticulate, passionate youth opposition to big business. A lot of the same sort of energy that we're seeing now around Occupy, these are kind of the same people. It was also very much in 1999 about the Lower East Side. It was about an aesthetic of sort of basement rec room porn with flash photography and wife beaters and Polaroid cameras. And then it became influenced by Wes Anderson's aesthetic and Rushmore, the Royal Tenenbaums, Dave Eggers' early work. These were kind of all of the things that were bubbling up into this new identity of the new modern hipster. Here's an image, a little bit different than James Dean. So let's go ahead and break that down into the image. We talked a little bit about the influence, but just so we're all sort of speaking the same language, the general stereotypes around what the modern hipster is. We'll just, for simplicity, you'll talk about it in four dimensions. The first being image. So the image is this sort of clashing collage of nostalgic, fashion trends. So it's, it's a mix of the low v-neck with the ironic pedophile mustache with the <laughs> Coke bottle glasses with the neon leg warmers and the, you know, basketball high tops. So that's sort of the image. Then there is a very discernible attitude, which is this kind of impossible combination of superiority and apathy. You might find the modern hipster reading David Foster Wallace with a soy latte and a gluten-free snack with just a huge scowl. (laughs) And then the social class, another kind of impossible pairing of someone who typically has a trust fund, who's Parents worked for a lot of money. They haven't probably earned it, but they identify with this working class and maybe collecting unemployment. (laughs) And then finally, you know, what their contribution to society is ultimately nothing, or I should say (laughs) nothing new. The hipster curates, picks and samples different trends, puts them all together and broadcasts them in social media until The real mass media picks it up and it's no longer cool. So all of these things are negative. It's no wonder nobody wants to be a hipster. Everybody hates them. (laughs) Underneath this, though, what's what's going on here? Uh, I, I think there is something unique about the hipster counterculture that is a product of the present landscape of America and the world in general. Hipsters are really the first counterculture to be created under the microscope of the modern Western advertising machine. By this, I mean that for the first time, within the amount of space that it takes to identify and recognize and adopt and broadcast a trend, there are brands that have already been doing that and selling it back to you. These same cool hunters who work for Coca-Cola are on the blogs that the hipsters are looking to find out what's going on and picking that up and putting it in a commercial. Of course, nobody wants to identify with the cool subculture that's already been bought and sold. And the velocity with which this can happen, technology and social media is is just so fast. That's a new thing. It reminds me of 1999 again when... Time Magazine put 
Lauren Hill on the cover, and it, it said, Hip Hop Nation. I don't know if you guys remember this. For me, this was an important moment. This was when I realized that hip hop was no longer cool. It had been bought and appropriated, and now there were people breakdancing with Dr. Peppers on TV. And so that sort of made me like new hip hop and rap and less, and it became more of a business. It became more identifiable as a business, and this has continued to go on. And when that happens, there's sort of a nostalgia, and all of a sudden, all I wanted to listen to was good old Tribe Called Quest and the Beastie Boys and Run DMC, and that was what, you know, back when it was authentic, back when it was this original form of creative expression. And so that all happened to hipsters. But instead of hipsters enjoying 20 years of sort of limelight on the stage like, like hip-hop did, it happened instantly. The other thing that I want to talk about is what does this collective identity and the negative perspective on the American hipster, what does it say about America in general? Now, if we go back to the dimensions that we talked about for the, the American hipster and sort of start with image, this is kind of depressing, but you know, I think that what's going on here, all of those things that contribute to the hipster's image are not about the present. Every fashion trend, you know, at the dawn of the modern hipster, sort of turn of turn of the millennium, you know, 2000 was about the 70s. That was sort of the low V-neck and the pedophile glasses to remind you. That was more it was actually like about the fashions of our parents, right? So it was like the late 70s, and then it kept progressing forward, and then it was about the 80s, and then, you know, sort of now it's like about the 90s. So it's, it's funny, it's, it's, it's strange that the youth who are supposed to be sort of the people defining the trend and what's happening and what's cool now and, and we're excited about the future are dwelling in the past. And, you know, when a civilization is thriving, the youth aren't supposed to be nostalgic about the past. They're supposed to be thinking about what's going on now in the future. So the second thing is this attitude, right? This um, superior apathy. Now, this is kind of akin to that college senior who has their eyes glazed over because like, they're no longer into the social scene. It's sort of like, you know, get me out of here into the real world. And I think this is kind of what a lot of Americans are feeling right now where we sort of enjoyed our apex and are seeing the other side of it. And we still have some of these sort of resources from the past of what's been built, but we didn't either build those ourselves or we're depressed about the present. But it's this sort of old superior you know, complex with this apathy about what to do about it now that we're not sort of on top of the world. Glorification of the worker class kind of goes further in that direction in thinking about, you know, what is this? This this aesthetic that is back to the trailer parks, that's sort of the hipster thing, right? It's like, it's no longer black racial, it's, it's white. And it's about flight to the suburbs. It's about going and getting blue collar jobs. It's about sort of, you know, those things associated with rebuilding a country. The hipsters aren't actually doing those jobs. They're just sort of adopting that image. But what it's saying is that, you know, this is about, this is about recession. This is about a time when those are the jobs that we need and that people can build in, in Detroit you know, imported from Detroit. I think that's what this social class aspect of, of hipsters is talking about. And then last, this, this contribution to society being sort of nothing. There's something going on here about a technology-induced laziness. The hipster has all of these great tools to curate and all of this you know, social media platform to broadcast, and with that comes immediate access to data of the past. It's so easy to go and find out all of these trends. And there's a burden, actually, not just an ability, but a burden to do that and broadcast it faster than the advertising machine is doing it. You need to know about it before they do. And so there's this feedback cycle where technology has allowed the hipster to sort of race against the media machine, and they don't have time to go and kind of 
in their closet and think about something and what's the next new thing going to be. It's about broadcasting it now. So all of these things, the image, the attitude, the social class, and the contribution to society, I think they really say that we're not totally happy with where we are right now, sort of American collective identity. And the fact that no one will admit to being a hipster means that we're, we're in denial. Now, the thing is, I think it's only once we admit to being hipsters that we can claim this and begin to do authentic things with it. I think that there are passionate people out there underneath this hipster moniker who believe in something and are just kind of too afraid to express that passion and they you know, feel like they need to be sort of cool and apathetic. So I'm hopeful, I'm optimistic that these people are out there and that is the emphasis for this American Hipster documentary project, which is why I'm here talking to you right now. My name is Bo, and I'm a hipster.